My name is Andrea Millwood Hargrave. I'm from the International Institute of Communications. And it is my honor to be able to introduce you to this conversation about regulating in the public interest with two of the most thoughtful regulators there are in this sector. Sebastian Soriano was appointed chairman of the French telecoms regulator, RCEP, in 2015, and his term there now draws to a close. During his tenure, he has also been chair of the European Regulators Forum, BEREC, as well as chair of Fratel, the network of French-speaking telecommunications regulators. Ian Scott, who is chairperson and CEO of the Converged Canadian Regulator, has over 25 years of policy and regulatory experience in both broadcasting and telecommunications and in both the private and public sectors. Importantly, he presided over this year's IIC 2020 uh, International Regulators Forum, which brought together regulators from across the world. Sebastian has recently published a book which calls for a radical rethink of the way in which regulation is conceived. He argues that the power of public movements in terms of ecology, in terms of collective thinking, and the evolution of digital technologies demand this rethink. Ian also has strong views on what regulating in the public interest might mean. Therefore, let me hand over to our two highly knowledgeable and sometimes very provocative speakers, Ian and Sebastian, over to you. Thank you. I am, I am very curious and would like to hear a little more from you about the ongoing experience in France um, related to broadband deployment. Um, you know that I've spoken about our experience in Canada um, at a number of IIC events. Um, it is perhaps our biggest challenge, in particular in the face of COVID, uh, with everyone working and doing school and so on at home. <clears throat> and you, in France, you have an interesting model um, in particular for the remote or less well-served areas. And I always, I always hesitate when I call <clears throat> in Europe, what you call remote is not quite the same as, as ours, but I think we face the same challenges. If you are in a relatively isolated village in the Alps, you may not have the kind of modern communications that you require. And that's no difference if you're 2,000 kilometers north of Ottawa, you know, in um, in more a less friendly climate, but they're still both the same. They're isolated. So, how is it going in terms of reaching that last? I, in France, I'm not sure if it's the last 10 percent or 5 percent, because that's I know our big challenge. To do that, we we change the way to identify the zones the the areas to cover before that uh, there was some kind of legal definition of white areas and the people on the ground they were really unhappy of this definition so we decided to give the power to the local authorities to the mayors so instead of defining uh, uh, white areas we said okay guys we cover we bring the network where you ask it to be. And the only limit to that is the number of masts, poles, uh, that the sector install in one year uh, uh, as an answer to your request. And so this, this number of sites has, uh, has been defined between 600 and 800 every year per operator. And so the mayors, the, 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 the local authorities, they are making requests and there is a system managed by the government with some hierarchy uh, that is done, some discussions. And thanks to that, it's really the, the power has been granted to the people that are on the ground. Uh, and this makes a real difference. Now, the local authorities and the mayors, they, they not only are the victims of the white areas, they are also the players, the actors that are bringing the network. 
in the white areas. And this makes a very important difference in terms of philosophy and also in terms of acceptation because the network cannot come in one day. Uh, by mm -hmm. empowering the local people, we also um, uh, give them the hand to explain better on the ground why the, the network ne needs time to, to come. So that's, that's basically what we did. It's a program called Mobile New Deal. Uh, it's two two year and a half that we have rolled it now, and uh, and it works it works well. Uh, we we measured very recently the the coverage of the uh, of the country in terms of uh, uh, square square kilometers, so not in population but in in, in mm -hmm. area, and uh, and we we came from uh, forty five percent. Of the of the surface covered by the four operator in cage in 4G, that was in in 2018, and now we are at seven six percent. So it's 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 wow. a huge move, and 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 hopefully, it's it's not the end. So that that's how we we we, we did that. But I would be very happy to hear from you, Jan, about what you did in Canada. Um, where where we are on broadband. Um, and I'm happy to say that there's the CRTC's activities, which are somewhat separate than the rest of government um, because we operate at arm's length as an independent regulator. Um, but our fund is funded or financed from the industry itself. Um, traditionally, we had, um, like many regulators, um, a, a subsidy pool that was there to ensure uh, telephone service in high cost areas. And a few years back, we changed that so that that fund or that subsidy is now available for broadband um, deployment. It's for the moment, $750 million over five years. Um, we issued our first decision uh, on that fund um, in relation to a call for proposals that we put out last year, and these are all in the more far north satellite dependent areas. So a number of five projects have been awarded um, and that will bring improved service to something like 1100 households in the far north, which is a significant number when you're talking about small communities um, distributed uh, across the north. <clears throat> and we have a call out for the rest of the country. We received about a little under 600 proposals um, at the end of June, uh, June 2020, and we are working our way through those. Um, and uh, we hope we look forward to uh, awarding further projects. Our, our fund is one element of government's um, commitment. The federal government recently announced a universal broadband fund um, and um, it's a little less than $2 billion in total. It will make a difference in a number of other government departments, infrastructure, as well as the provinces, provincial governments have programs too. Um, so there's a lot of work going on. Um, we would estimate that we will easily reach 90% um, of the Canadian population with our target of 50 megabytes download 10 up um, in the next year or so. The real challenge is that last 10%. And there are a couple of things in addition to all of these programs uh, on the horizon. Um, there are some fiber builds in the North that are, um, that are soon to get underway. And we are also looking very carefully at the developments around low earth orbit satellites which for a country like Canada could be a true game changer. It could represent fiber-like speeds and latency in areas that will be very, very okay. difficult to reach uh, by traditional means. So there's a lot going on as there should be. This is, mm, I think, uh, probably, certainly the, the most Im important uh, area of activity uh, on the telecom side. One of the things that um, I focused on since I arrived as chair, um, I wanted 
not only to um, make sure we were engaged in international outreach to learn best practices from various regulators, I also found that most of our data collection was backward looking, as, as is often the case. Um, the government, St Statistics Canada, the government department that does surveys um, has um, collects detailed information. We collect detailed information from broadcasters as well as telecom. But what we didn't do as well was able to take the information we had and look forward to identify the kinds of changing technology issues and changing regulatory challenges. And that's something we've been improving on. Um, and I know that you, um, uh, you do uh, as well. So I just wonder how have you changed your approach during your term to the collection of data and the use of data uh, as a telecom regulator? Yes, I share totally the, the, the starting point you mentioned, Jan, meaning that regulators traditionally use data on a stat statistical, let's say, uh, uh, um, perspective. And, and I think this perspective is also of utmost importance because we are bringing some, some reference data to, to the market. And this is, this is important to, to give a clear path for, for investment decision. But in the same time, um, uh, uh, what I what I what what appeared to me uh, was that um, we 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 were underusing some some kind of gold mine uh, and mm -hmm. um, especially the power of the consumer and how we can as a regulator uh, bring the right information to the consumer and even in 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 its uh, um, uh, shopping process, let's say, to influence the market with this same uh, objective to, 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 to give the right direction in the public interest. So we had one specific, one specific problem in France uh, at the beginning of my mandate. The prices were very low, but the investments were uh, inefficient to face the, the 4G and the fiber uh, um, cliff. And so we decided to develop very accurate information to help the consumer to choose their uh, network, their operator, not only because of the price, but also because of the quality and the coverage, especially for a mobile uh, uh, service. And so we put much energy on that and uh, uh, we, we, we issued maps, for instance. And these maps were very interesting because you enter in a real conversation with maps. When you say, for instance, okay, uh, the, the, the country is covered by 90%. Actually, nobody can contradict that because, I mean, it doesn't mean nothing to anybody. But if you publish a map and you say, okay, this is where uh, the, 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 the network exists, then people can say, Oh, okay, so there are many, many places where there is no network and people better, people can say, oh, you say there is network here, please come in my house, you will see it's not the case at all. And so you enter in a really different direction, uh, in, a, in a really different discussion where you, you, you give the, the weapons, let's say, to the people to really um, a challenge what operators are, are doing. Uh, and, and, and so it's really for me a question, let's say, of democracy at some extent, because we were like experts assessing figures that 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 was not um, saying anything to the people. Uh, and, and thanks to that, we create a public debate. We public we created a, a, a real awareness of the situation. And I think that this awareness was a first step then to bring the decisions to fix the problem. Um, and the other, the other uh, interaction loop, let's say, we created uh, was to, um, to, to nudge, let's say, the, the consumers in, in their choices by um, working with uh, many measurement tools like uh, Ookla, like uh, NPERF, OpenSignal, and all these companies, we worked with them very technically 
to help them to give the most accurate information to the consumers, um, to make sure that the consumers were well informed and were able to choose their network in the right uh, in the right way regarding their needs. Um, and and it's really, I mean, it was um, uh, a, a very I think we have we have uh, made the lines move uh, uh, on the market, um, and uh, it also has changed how we consider ourselves. Meaning that it brings humility in the public decision, uh, because when when you create this transparency, uh, I mean, you accept to. <laughs> to be very to be challenged sometimes very very fiercely and, and i think this is good also for the public uh, bodies to be to be challenged very strongly uh, i think it's a real way I, to, I understand to what you mean when when regulators arm consumers with facts and information then that is exactly what they're armed with and you have to answer the challenges um we it, it's interesting again you say that I think we have something to learn from you on the wireless side. We, we do detailed mapping and we work with other government departments on broadband. And that's being very helpful because um, we're able to identify areas that are served uh, and areas that are only partly served. Because um, as you know, as, as you just said, you might have um, most of the households in a small town served, but five minutes away, there's a group of households that have no service and we think they're served. So that kind of mapping we are doing on the broadband side, I'm not aware, certainly the CRTC hasn't tried to develop that kind of map to date um, on the wireless side. So we may have to come knocking at your door. With a great pleasure, Yann. Well, C'est mon plaisir. <laughs> <laughs>